Poetry Center bringing poetry to Patterson since 1980 at Passaic County Community College. Maziotti Gillen, and I'm pleased to welcome you here uh, to the Poetry Center in the Hamilton Club at Passaic County Community College. We're really proud and happy today to be presenting uh, our distinguished poet, Ruth Stone. Uh, this reading has been made possible by a grant from the New Jersey State Council on the Arts Department of State, and all the activities of the Poetry Center are also made possible by individual donations and our Poets in the Schools program is made possible by the Geraldine R. Dodge Foundation. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit about Ruth Stone. Uh, Ruth's last book of poems, Ordinary Words, was awarded the National Book Critics Circle Award in 2000. She also won the Patterson Poetry Prize for her wonderful book, Secondhand Coat, and is the author of Who is the Widow's Muse, Simplicity, and An Iridescent Time, among others. She has received the John Simon Guggenheim Fellowship in Poetry twice, the Kenyon Review Fellowship, the Delmore Schwartz Award, the White and the Whiting Writers Award. Ms. Stone is a professor of English at Binghamton University of the State University of New York. Now, I have to say something else. One thing is that, uh, that Ruth Stone is such a trooper that um, she came here, although she, she's lost a great deal of her sight, and uh, so you're going to have to be patient if she has some difficulty. Uh, her daughter Abigail is going to assist her, and she's typed up the uh, poems in large type for her to help her. Uh, but she's uh, just wonderful, and she was practicing at my house, and is so superb, you're in for a great treat. Um, in addition to that, I want to say that there are a lot of poets writing in America today, but I think that Ruth Stone is a major voice, a major American poet who's writing in such a unique and brilliant way that her poems will be read in 100 years, 200 years, 5,000 years. Let's welcome the inimitable Ruth Stone and her daughter, uh, Abigail. Oh, wait, and I forgot to say that our signer is Rosemary Johnston and is a wonderful, wonderful signer. Okay, let's welcome... Ruth Stone and her daughter Abigail. I hope I know this one by heart, but it's called Curtains. All right. Uh, putting up new curtains, other windows intrude, as though it is that first winter in Cambridge when you and I had just moved in. Now, cold borscht alone in a bare kitchen. What does it mean if I say this years later? Listen, last night I am on a crime jag with my landlord, Mr. Tempesta. I sneaked in two cats. He screams. He screamed, no pets, no pets. I become my Aunt Virginia proud, but weak in the head. I remember Anna Magnani. I throw a few books, I shout. He wipes his eyes and opens his hands. Okay, okay, keep the dirty animals, but no nails in the walls. We cry together. I am so nervous, he says. I want to dig you up. Is that all there? I want to dig you up and say, look, look, it's like that time, remember, when I ran into our living room naked to get rid of that fire inspector? <laughs> See what you miss by being dead? <laughs> In an iridescent time, my mother, when young, scrubbed laundry in a tub. She and her sisters on an old brick walk under the apple trees, sweet rub-a-dub. The bees came round their heads, the wrens made talk. Four young ladies, each with a rainbow board, honed their knuckles, wrung their wrists to red, wiped, tossed back their braids, and wiped their aprons wet. The Jersey calf beyond the back fence roared, and all the soft day swarms about their pet, 
buzzed at his big brown eyes and bullish head. Four times they rent, she said. Some things they starched, then shook them from the baskets two by two and pinned the fluttering intimacies of life between the lilac bushes and the yew, brown gingham, pink, and skirts of Alice Blue. I'm reading these early, these are early poems, aren't they? Mm -hmm. You don't have to read it if you don't want to. I don't know, what is it? Orchard. 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 Do I want to read that one? Yes, you do. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The mare roamed soft about the slope. Her rump was like a dancing girl's. Gentle beneath the apple tree, she pulled the grass and shook the flies. Her forelocks hung in tawny curls. She had a woman's limpid eyes, a woman's patient stare that grieves. And when she moved among the trees, the dappled trees, her look was shy. She hid her nakedness in leaves. A Delicate. Delicate though, weighted dance, she stepped while flocks of finches flew from tree to tree and shot the leaves with songs of golden twittering. How admirable her tender stance. And then the apple trees were new, and she was new, and we were new. And in the barn, the stallion stamped and shook the hills with trumpeting. <sighs> called Spring Beauties. Oh, let's see if I can do it. Let's see. Uh, I have to use this. The, the abandoned building, the abandoned campus, empty brick buildings in early June when you came to visit me, crossing the state's midway, the little stra the little belts, the, straggled, the belt. straggled belts of little roads. Hitchhiking with your portable typewriter. The campus, an academy of trees, under which some hand, the wind, I guess, had scattered the pale light of thousands of spring beauties. Petals stained with pink veins. Petals stained with pink veins. Secret, blooming for themselves. We sat among them. Your long fingers, thin body, and long bones of improbable genius. Some scattered gene as Kafka must have had. Your deep voice, this passing dust of miracles. That simple. That simple that was myself. Mm. Half conscious. Half conscious as though each page, moment was each it. moment was a page where words appeared. The bent hammer of the type struck against the moving ribbon. The light air, the restless leaves, the ripple of time warped by our longing. There, as if we were painted by some unknown impressionist. Mm. <laughs> I hope I don't stumble that way. I won't. I mean, who is this one? The nose. The nose. I oh, think good. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm in agony over not being able to see better. Try and do it without it. No, I have to have it. Okay. <laughs> let's see. The nose. Let's see. Everyone. Everyone complains about the nose. If you notice, it is stuck to your face. In the morning, it will be red. If you are a woman, it, you cover it with makeup. If you are a man, it means you had a good time last night. <laughs> Noses are phallic symbols, so are fingers, monuments, trees, and cucumbers. The familiar he knows his stuff should be looked into. That, that, huh, there's big business in nose jobs. The small nose. The small nose having gained popularity during the Christian boom. <laughs> Noses get out of joint, but a broken nose is never the same thing as a broken heart. They say, bless your heart, shake hand, blow your nose. 
When kissing, there is apt to be a battle of wills over which side your nose will go on. <laughs> while I, while a nosebleed. a nosebleed is never the same thing. Nope. Next no. to a good cry. Oh. oh, what is it? Well, a nosebleed bleed next, next to a good cry is a natural natural physic. A nosy person smells you out, and looking down your nose will make you cross-eyed. <laughs> Although the nose is no longer used for rooting and shoving, it still gets into some unlikely places. The old sayings, he won by a nose, and he cut off his nose to spite his face, illustrate the value of the nose. In conclusion, in conclusion three out of four children are still born equipped. equipped with noses at birth, and the nose, more often than not, accompanies the body to its last resting place. <laughs>
Oh, I've got half forgotten. And the coat. coat they made turned all of an innocent mind and a single love into beasts afraid. Was it I called him back? Was it hunger? Was it the world? Not my cries of the murdered, not my tears, not my cries of the murdered, but twas the fox hid in the woods who called, and the smell of the fox burned in his mind. The fox. Oh. He's dead, oh, no. smiling. Yeah. Around, around, the fox in his den, smiling. smiling around his red, around his red body, his fine plume curled out of the valley and across the river, leaving his sheep's hair. He left the maligned flocks. I heard him coming through brambles, through narrow forests. I, how I, I, I bid my nights unwind. I bid my days turn back. I broke my windows. I unsealed my locks. Mm. Oh, I guess, am I reading too fast? All right. Male gorillas. Mm, golly. I think I can, I have to think what it is first. Um, I, haven't, I haven't read anything. Uh, and haven't even tried to read much since when last summer, uh, sometime, and just sort of been sunk in this blindness. But, and this is the first reading I've even tried to do, so I'm sorry. I hope I can get better. All right, male gorillas at the donut shop. 23 silverbacks are lined up at the bar, sitting on the stools. It's morning coffee and trash day. The waitress has a heavy feeling face. Consider it. Consider it with Carmen lipstick. <laughs> she doesn't, she doesn't brown. brown my fries. I st have to stand in la at the counter and insist on my order. I take my cup of coffee to a small, inoffensive table along the wall. At the counter, the male chorus line is lined up tight. I look at their, I look at their almost identical butts, <laughs> their buddy hunched shoulders, the curve of their ancient spines. They are, they are, bra they are methodically browsing in their own territory. <laughs> this data goes into that vast, confused library, the female mind. <laughs> so sweet. <laughs> this is called So What? For me, the great, what's wrong? Oh, well, we keep hearing All right, that. sorry. So what? For me, <laughs> for me, the great truths are laced with hysteria. How many Einsteins can we tolerate? I keep, I leap, I leap into the uncertainty principle. After so many smears, you want to wash it off with a laugh. Ha ha, you say. So what if it's a meltdown? <laughs> Last lines to poems I will write immediately. <laughs> see. This is called words. <clears throat> Wallace even says, a poet looks at the world as a man looks at a woman. I can never know what a man sees when he looks at a woman. That is a sealed universe. <laughs> Yes. On the outside of the bubble, everything is stretched, stretched to infinity. Along the blacktop, trees are bearded as, as old men, like rows of nodding gray-bearded mandarins. Their second-hand beards were spun by female gypsy moths. <laughs> All mandarins are trapped in their images. A poet looks at the world as a woman looks at a man. Mm -hmm. 1941. I wore a large brim hat 
like the women in the ads, how thin I was, such skin. Yes, it was Indianapolis, a taste of sin. You had a natural afro, no money for a haircut. We were in the CD part, the buildings all run down, the record shop, the jazz impeccable. We moved like the blind, relying on our touch. At the corner coffee shop, after an hour's play with our serious game on paper, the waitress asked us to move on. It wasn't much. Oh, mortal love, your bones were beautiful. I touched, I traced them with my fingers. Now the light grows less. You were so angular. The air darkens with steel and smoke. The cracked world about to disintegrate in the arms of my total happiness. Oh, my uh, grandson used that. Uh, and then what was the other one he used? Re reality or? Re uh, well, he used something. two of my poems, but that was one of them. Uh, 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 what kind of music is it? It's, it's modern. Yes. You know <laughs> what they do. All kinds with machinery and everything. <laughs> <laughs> and I was reading those poems, and he taped that, and he incorporated it into his um, music. I, my daughter thinks it would make a hit record. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Codicil. I'm still bitter about the last place we stayed. The bed was really too small for both of us. In that same rooming house, walls were lined with filing cases, drawers of bird's eggs packed in cotton. The landlady, uh, the landlady described them as widow of the ornithologist. Actually, he was a postal clerk. <laughs> she was proprietor of the remains, had accompanied him on his, on his holidays collecting eggs. Yes, he would send her up the tree, and when she <laughs> faltered, he would shout, put it in your mouth, put it in your mouth. <laughs> It was nasty, she said, <laughs> closing the drawer with her knee. <laughs> Faintly blue, freckled, freckled mauve, cho to to chalk white eggs. <clears throat> As we turned the second flight of stairs toward a mattress unfit for two, her voice would echo up the well something about an electric kettle at the foot of our bed. Eggs. Eggs, eggs, in secret muted shapes in my head. Hundreds of unborn wizened eggs. I think about them when I think of you. Yeah, that's the other one that he used. Oh, this is the other one he used on the rec. <laughs> on the, and one place on one ear and one place on the other, the word residue. Will I ever feel again, living at loose ends, nothing finished? The, cup, the odor of your body sometimes returns in the afternoon. A deja vu rises from books in the back room, poems of Wallace Stevens. Your fruit of the loom shorts packed so long in the attic, alternately freezing and thawing. Or the, or the picture of Delmore Schwartz sitting on a bench in a small, a small fenced-in park, his long gangster over style coat, his legs crossed, the edges of a newspaper lifting in the wind. It's vacant. His vacant stare, dead white, vaguely petulant, lost trying to remember you, I ask myself, who was that dark Semite? Your face, your voice, all but your hands and feet faded. In the next galaxy. Tell them about that. 
What about it? It's your new book. Oh, yeah, that's the title of my new book, which I hope will come out in the fall, this coming fall, at a different press. What is it? Um, Copper, Canyon. Copper Canyon is going to publish it. You want to say why? Uh, why? Because of the Paris press being so icky? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> in the next galaxy, and in, uh, in the next galaxy, things will be different. No one will lose their sight, their hearing, or their gallbladder. It will be all cat skills with brand new wraparound verandas. The idea of Hitler will not have vibrated yet. While back here, they are still cleaning out pockets of wrinkled Nazis hiding in Argentina. But in the next galaxy, certain planets will have true blue skies and drinking water. What's this? Margaret Street. Margaret Street. In September, Margaret Street waits for the comet. No one but the Earth knows that it is coming. And the Earth, with its extravagant garments like Salome's veils, gyrates in the sensual clasp. In September, the deepest basins gush up their silt. On Margaret Street, the neighbors take out their trash. It is Sunday. Each delayed moment is rested out of the seething mass. On Mitchell Ave, where vision was still brilliant, I suffered small indignities. Ignorance lies always in the past. Oh, language that follows like the comet's tail. The rubble. The rubble of senseless longing for what was. Lesson. Tell them about it. All right. This poem goes back to uh, the hippie period. Uh, and uh, Madison, uh, I was teaching at Madison, uh, in Madison at uh, University, Madison, Wisconsin. And uh, this uh, was about a student uh, who was there. And I saw him and knew what was going on. The Vietnam War. Uh, Vietnam War and the protest. There were huge marches and protests <clears throat> against the Vietnam War. And then the National Guard came in and, you know, the whole thing, uh, which has culminated now in what we have in Washington. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> finally. They finally got it in place. All right. Lesson. In the days when his mind was simple, before he learned the rules, Sam A. was a pupil in the, in the orchards. In the what? Orchards. Orchards of the people. He went to school. Dense. Dense rhetoric and physics. And beards. And beards to hide the fools. Napalm and pears and peaches and marvelous cutting tools. Ways and means, the National Guard and saffron submarines drugs. He leaned behind his, beyond his body on an uncharted course. Hairy and sick and sweating, he earned the mind's inverse. And bitter in his hide with speed and speed and worse. He, with and oily glands and scales, he lay on the floor and cried in Madison's crowded jails. And they, and, What's this? In the days. Oh, days when his mind was simple, before he learned the rules. Sam A. was a poet in the orchards of the people, and his agony was to know it among the clean-shaven fools. Napalm and pears and peaches, we learn what the pupil teaches, that the mind is the body's curse with its simian arm that reaches out to the universe. Good advice. Here is not exactly here, 
because it passed by there two seconds ago where it will not come back. Although you adjust to this, nothing you say, just the way it is. How poor we are with all this running through our fingers. Here, says the devil, eat. It's paradise. You want to say your other advice, Tom? How do we go? My hazard. My hazard wouldn't be yours, not ever. But every doom, like a hazelnut, comes down to its own worm. So I'm rocking here like any granny with her apron over her head saying, Lordy me, it's my trouble. There's nothing to be learned this way. If I heard a girl crying help, I would go to save her. But you hardly ever hear those words. Dear children, you must try to say something when you are in need. Don't confuse hunger with greed. And don't wait until you are dead. <laughs> This is called Mantra. When I am sad, I sing, remembering the red-winged blackbird's clack. Then I want no thing except to turn time back to what I had before love made me sad. When I forget to weep, I hear the peeping tree toads creeping up the bark. Love lies asleep and dreams that everything is in its golden net. And I am caught there too when I forget. Can I do this one? <clears throat> yeah, without the paper, I think. Do the, uh, the excuse? Mm -hmm. Do they write poems when they have something to say, something to think about, rubbed from the world's hard rubbing in the excess of every day? The summer I was 20, 24 in San Francisco, you and I, the whole summer seemed like a cable car ride over the Gold Bay. But once in a bistro, angry at one another, we quarreled about a taxi fare. I doubt that it was the fare we quarreled about, but one excuse is as good as another <laughs> in the excess of passion and the need to be worn away. Do they know it is cleanness of skin, firmness of flesh that matters? It is so difficult to look at the deprived or smell their decay. But now I am among them. I too am a leper, a warning. I hold out my crippled fingers. My voice flatters everyone who comes this way. In the weeds of mourning, groaning and gnashing, I display myself in malodorous comic wrappings and tatters in the excess of passion in the need to be worn away. I have to say that a lot of these poems are rhyming, and some of them, it's because I usually don't rhyme either. Isn't that funny? <laughs> but my daughter helped me pick these out, and there are some that I guess I know better than others, because they're earlier poems and a lot of rhyming. What is this one? The Splinter. Yeah. Oh, I don't, I've got to remember what one it is. I had a sil little silver medal. Oh, I don't think I'll read it. <laughs> Why not? I'll do this one. Tongues. To mortify the spirit, I once attended some classes of beginning French, etc. <laughs> and have I climbed toward heaven or descended? It does not matter. I am not one whom God can hope to save by dying twice. I am lost among the words of sacrament. What can I say but that I love the wind, and I am shaken when it shakes and scatters the stuttering leaves on the insensible pavement. Okay, and this last one is called Translation. Hey, why don't you read the splinter first? All right, splinter. Splinter. <laughs> I had a little silver mannequin who walked and talked and petted me. I pampered him, he pampered me, we were convivial. On the gray streets of many a gray city, he wept with me. Oh, then, how miniature was sin. How clear its purpose, like a looking glass, to show me my young girl's skin. But I looked and looked again and saw a blue cadaverous vein. I will grow old, I cried. You are a silver groom. I will be a brown leather bride. Still by my side, you will shine in the wine that puckers my hide. And in my, these sad reflections, I took a silver hammer made of words and hit him 
and he shattered like bright birds flying in all direction. All night and all eternity I cried, and in the morning by the gray light, I found his splinter in my side. And when I drew it out, I saw it was glass, the finest concave mirror, silver white and backed with brightest silver. Oh, alas, he was a mannequin of glass with all his light turned in and mirrored in the dark, the mannequin. Oh. Now, I hope I can read this, but let's see, it's called translation. Did you want to say something before you end? What? <laughs> <laughs> what do I say? Give me a hint. No, you want to, I don't know. You think well, I can ask her questions. What? Okay. Um, you have a whole lot of different pairs of glasses. Yeah, I'm trying to see all kinds of ways, uh, and I, you know, I keep I keep trying. I'm. I hope I can, and I'm going to learn Braille. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. I hope. All right. <laughs> I don't know how difficult it is. It might be too. All right. Translations. <laughs> Forty-five years ago, Alexander Mihailovich Taritsyn son of a uh, white Russian owner of a silk stocking factory in Constantinople. Rumbled. We rumbled your rooming house bed, sneaked past your landlady, and turned your plaster Madonna to the wall. <laughs> Are you out there, short, vulgar, civil engineer? Did you know I left you for a Princeton geologist who called me girly? <laughs> 10 years later, he was still in the Midwest when he died under a rockfall. I told you I was pregnant. You gave me money for the abortion. I lied to you. I needed clothes to go out with the geologist. <laughs> Where am I? Oh, there it is. <laughs> Let's see. You called me Kushka, little cap. Sometimes I... Stop. Sometimes I stopped by the civil engineering library where you sat with other students. You were afraid my husband, you were embarrassed. You were, embarrassed. you were afraid my husband might catch you. He was in the chemistry lab with his Bunsen burner boiling water for tea. <laughs> Alexander Mihailovich Taritsyn, son, fig. fig of my pallid college days, plum of my head. Did the silk stocking factory go up in flames? Did the German fox jump out of the desert sleeve and gobble your father up? Are you dead? Second hand engine, is that right? Second hand engine for okay. engineer. Uh, no, it's up. engine. Okay. Second hand engine formula concrete. Oh, we were still sitting, meeting. meeting in stairwells when the best chess player in Champaign-Urbana went to the Spanish Civil War. He couldn't resist heroic gestures. <laughs> for years, I was, for years I was haunted by the woman who, sma who smashed her starving infant against the Spanish wall. Cautious. Cautious stayed Mihailovich. So quick to pick my hairpins out of your bed. Average lover, have your balls decayed? <laughs> Mihailovich, my husband, the, the chemist with big light eyes and big head, the one whose body I hated, came back in the flesh 15 years ago. He was wearing a tight Western shirt he had made himself. There wasn't anything he couldn't do. <laughs> he talked about wine and cheese tasting parties. We folk danced at a ski lodge, so this is life, I said. He told my daughter he was her daddy. It wasn't true. You are all so boring. My friend from Japan, Kana Maeda, the scholar of classical haiku, uh, whose fingers whose entire body had been trained to comply. After her, her, face pale. her face pale without powder, her neck so easily bent. After she died, she died from the radiation, 
Oh God, her I forgot. Translations of her translations of Basho were published by interested men who failed to print her correct name. So that narrow book appears to have been written by a man. Hmm. Faded. Faded in these ways. She is burned on my flesh. on my flesh as kimonos were burned on the flesh of women in the gamma rays of Hiroshima. She wasn't one of those who died, whose skin, whose skin peeled in the Holocaust, whose, whose bones cracked. Graceful and obscure, she was among, was among all those others who died later. Where are you, my, where are you, my repulsive, repulsive Russian? Are you also lost, pimpled, obscene boy, employed at an early age by your father? You pandered his merchandise on trays, using, using a woman's, using your, arm. Uh, your arm as a woman's leg slipped inside a silk stocking with a woman's shoe on your hand. Do you know, do you, how does it go after Do you that? understand? Do you, Do you understand, understand that? that later I lived with a transvestite, a hairdresser who wore wigs? When he felt that way, he would go out and pick up an English professor. <laughs> after we quarreled, I cut up his foam rubber falsies. <laughs> I had a garage sale. I, while he was out, while he was out of town, I sold his mail, mail order high heels, his corsets, his, his sequined evening gowns. Mm. Those, afternoons. Those afternoons in bed, listening to your memories of prostitutes with big breaths, how you wanted to roll on a mattress of mammary glands. The same when Rip Hansen told me about the invasion of France crossing the channel he saw infantry falling past him from split open cargo planes, still clinging to tanks and bulldozers. <laughs> Statistical losses figured in advance. The ripped open remnants of a Russian girl nailed up by the Germans outside her village, also ancient, indigenous. But what can I tell you about death? Even your mother's even, your, Even your sainted mother's soft, no body, her flower-dusted breasts, by now are slime paths of microorganisms. Where were you when they fed the multitudes to the ovens, old fetid fish eyes? Did they pull you, roll, you. roll you in at the cannery? Did you build their bridges or blow them up? Are you burned to powder? Were you mortarized? Did you die in a ditch, Mihailovich? Are you exorcised? Poor, innocent lecher, you believed in sin. I see you rising with the angels, thin, forgotten, dirty-fingered son of a silk-stocking factory owner in Constantinople. May you be exonerated. May you be forgiven. May you be a wax taper in paradise. Alexander Mihailovich Turitsyn. being so patient. Uh, I'm sorry I stumbled, but... Maybe uh, if anyone has some questions they'd like to ask Ruth, I'm sure she'd be happy to answer them. If you have any questions about um, anything, her work, or whatever. Anybody? Go ahead. Not a question, a comment. I think it takes more courage than I've got to stand and read when you can't see well. 
where I'm wearing a hat, I have to take it off. <laughs> but I had my daughter. I had my daughter. And she's wonderful. Um, I'm, I'm certainly writing. I have, I've written many, many notebooks since I've lost my eyes. But I, I can write. Uh, I can't read it, but I can write, and other people can type it up for me, uh, hopefully, as being done some. Uh, what I do regret are the many, many notebooks in Vermont, oh, thousands of poems that I didn't ever type up that are now going to have to, somebody's going to have to help me with them, or maybe, I don't know what to do. I've been writing since I was six, uh, deadly. <laughs> kind of awful. Yeah. You're so kind. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Don't be shy. Uh, can, what? I'm sorry. Louder. Mm -hmm. Can you uh, describe the change in your work habits over some years as uh, time has gone on? Well, I'll tell you. The odd thing about this is that. Uh, I really didn't write them. I don't know who wrote them. <laughs> they came from here and just went through me. And I used to think I didn't know where they came from. I finally figured out it was one side of my brain talking to the other, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. But you know, I do not know because I haven't had, it isn't that I don't work on them or that I haven't worked on them, but it's like they come to me that way and they always have. I don't know why. <laughs> you know, but, uh, I'll tell you one thing though. When my mother was nursing me and I was her first child, she was reading In Memoriam by Tennyson out loud. <laughs> <laughs> I always figure uh, that had something to do with it. <laughs> that should have ruined you. What? That should have ruined you. <laughs> didn't really. It didn't really, no. I, Although these poems have rhythm and rhyme that I read today, most of my work is, is um, it's not that it doesn't have uh, rhythm, but I, it's more, it's more, I mean, I've got great body of work that is not at all rhyming, really, yeah. I want to say publicly, I told you privately before, but speaking <coughs> of mothers, um, and you and I met 15 years ago at the first Waterloo Poetry Festival. Yeah. And this September, um, my own mom died. And it's the first festival that I missed. Mm -hmm. And in my own grieving process, I did a series of three poems. And the third one, What Swims Up from My Listening Ear But You're the Nose Poem. My nose poem. And so it's such I'm... a blessing that I got to hear the nose poem again. Sharon Olds used to read the nose every time she gave a reading for many years. <laughs> I don't think she bothered to say who wrote it. Either. <laughs> uh, I know most of you write poetry, you must, or are involved with it. Um, and I was saying to my daughter or somebody, is it possible that poetry still matters? I guess it does, it should. It does. Mm -hmm. Yes? What's your inspiration nowadays? Um, <coughs> like, where are you getting your inspiration? Nowadays? Yeah, now. Well, some of these, uh, some of these, uh, what was that? Um, uh, a couple, two or three of these are very recent poems. Uh, um, Tell me your new book title. It's in the next galaxy. No, one after that. Oh, In the Dark. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And a lot of them are coming out in uh, magazines like um, uh, American Poetry Review and uh, the Iowa Review and uh, I, I don't know, a lot of them. Uh, uh, and they're, uh, they're, they're ones I've written since I've lost my sight. So it's kind of interesting to, <coughs> I don't know. I have to say that probably I'm, I, you know, I'm still fumbling, I know I am. Uh, but it's, it's a different world when you can't, when you get like this, of course. Uh, and I think a lot of my poetry is 
a page or less now long because I can't, I can't I, if I leave it for a second, I forget where I was anyway, you know, and I can't see to go back. So, <laughs> it's different. <laughs> yeah. mm. Yes? Can you give your students any advice about writing poetry? Well, I think that one of the main things is in, um, in my relationship with the students has been to do like my mother did for me, I think, and that is just love what they do and uh, help them sometimes with when they you need help. But the thing of it is, uh, it's a process that can only be done by the person. It's an art form that you, do, you just have to develop yourself. You can encourage and you can make tiny, unimportant suggestions. <laughs> but the thing of it is, the poem comes from the person's psyche, and it, they're, it's totally their life and everything, their mind. And so it's a very tricky thing. Uh, and I think I've been, Maria's wonderful with teaching this. And I think I've been OK, uh, because I've gone at it from what I, I, from what I know is true of me. And also, I have to say that I have a daughter, and uh, I have two daughters who are writers, and I have grandchildren who write and are artists of all, you know, that way. And uh, I think that I did the same with them that my mother did with me, and that is I just loved what they did, and just gave, if they wanted materials, you give them materials. And, you know, you listen, you like it. They go on, they develop. It's, um, it's, Success breeds success, you know. It just does. Uh, mm. I think the mistake that many teachers have made, unfortunately, is being very rigid about laying down the laws of how you do this, this, and this, and the, in that kind of way in writing. And if, I remember one girl at the University of California where Carl Sandberg, uh, Carl Shapiro was, and that uh, she'd had him for a teacher. And he had been unkind to her about her work. She could never write again. It did, he killed it. And that can happen. Mm -hmm. I had a, an English professor, I don't know, who was 60 years ago, who said it was impossible to teach poetry. She said, the only thing you can do is read it and try to understand it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, it's true that um, there's a lot of poetry that's scholarly, say, you know, Milton and so forth. I mean, uh, there have been lots of scholarly references, but usually footnotes take on take care of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, each person, I think each person, um, uh, you know, uh, hears differently. We hear differently. And we get what we can. There isn't anyone who isn't changing moment by moment as long as you live. You don't, you don't remain static. And so all of that contributes to understanding. Mm -hmm. Sometimes when you think about something you knew, a poem you knew a, a long time ago, and all of a sudden the meaning of it, because bingo, you know? When you didn't truly, fully understand it, because you weren't old enough, maybe. You hadn't lived enough, maybe. I don't know. Yeah. Well, I love all of you. Thank you. Wait, there's a question there. There's another question. Oh. question in the back there. Who have you um, counted upon your uh, influences over the years? Who have you read a lot of? What? What poets have you read a lot of over the years? Over the years? I read prose. <laughs> I couldn't get enough prose. I read all, I read, uh, I, you know, of course I grew up on Hans Christian Andersen and uh, Nails and the Wonderful Goose. Did you ever hear of that? Selma Lagerlof? Uh, a Beatrix Potter, <laughs> you know. Um, I think children's books made a profound, uh, uh, children's books are often beautifully written. The good ones are wonderfully written. Um, 
And then, um, what? I was afraid of copying anyone, so for many years I wouldn't read poetry. I didn't want anyone to be like, and <laughs> what made me that way? I don't know, but uh, uh, I, the Bible I knew, uh, because my parents on Monday night when my father was off, they would read the King James Version of the Bible and the Psalms and so forth. I'm sure they were made an influence on me a lot. Uh, but I, I didn't start really reading poetry until I was teaching and had to. But <laughs> <laughs> well, your mother read to you. My mother read, uh, yeah, Tennyson, my God, yes. <laughs> In memoriam. <laughs> yeah. Great for sense of form and um, beautiful rhythms in uh, In Memoriam, beautiful. He was a good poet, <laughs> cuckoo Victorian. <laughs> There's a question back here. Oh, yes, uh, you uh, refer to Wallace Stevens. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. What about Wallace Stevens? Yes. What about him? No. <laughs> <laughs> what? Wallace Stevens twice. What did she say? You read two poems mentioning Wallace Stevens. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, of course, I, uh, I met Wallace Stevens several times, uh, and, uh, uh, and I actually uh, think he's a, th thought he was, um, in this later years, I think he's a, he's a good poet. Um, uh, let's see. Well, I was reading some Wallace Stevens, I think, when I wrote that poem. Uh, probably. Mm -hmm. but, um, uh, he also, uh, you know, he lived in a male world. Uh, women uh, have, I think, uh, managed to uh, rise very high in the world of poetry, uh, in my opinion. They've really come into their own. Uh, but, you know, uh, the veneration that was paid many, many wonderful male poets was not given to women. Maybe still isn't, I'm not sure. Hard to tell. But well, Wallace Stevens? Mm, well, I've got all his books. And uh, I've looked at them, but I don't study him or anything. Mm -mm. Mm -hmm. uh, you seem to have not let up with your energy, your beauty, your 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 lust for life. <laughs> uh, where is all that coming from? I is, don't know. Is that I think it's that's... probably. I think partly it's because I have wonderful children, and uh, uh, and it's also part of. I think maybe it's. Um, I don't know. I, I am a naturally buoyant and a naturally happy person. Uh, and not that I don't haven't suffered and been depressed and so forth, but I think that uh, for some reason or other, my tendency is to become happy if given the opportunity. And I suppose buoyancy comes from a deep well of happiness, probably because I had a wonderful mother. And my mother doesn't believe in death or old age or any of that. She's totally uh, oblivious to all that. So no, she's thinking no about point it. in uh, thinking about it. So she I'm doesn't get old. I'm aware of it. <laughs> I'm aware of it. It isn't that. I don't know. It's that I. I guess over. I know that we live moment only in the moment, except for memory, and. Um, uh, moment to moment, uh, if that's what you have, you know, this is it, you know, right now, isn't it? What, do you have anything to say for those folks who are wanting to write, God, they want to write, but for whatever reason, whether it's peer pressure, whether it's family, whether it's culturally, whether it's society saying yeah. that, you know, people who write, or especially, I hear this quite a bit, people who write poetry are not really kind of with us. They're like those other people. And I'm saying to myself, 
these are the folks who are keeping humanity, keeping the world right. in perspective. What, is there anything you can say to hopefully inspire someone to pick up the pencil or pen that first time? I think that the one thing you uh, try, you, you must, you need to do, is to put out of your mind what you ought to say, and just start saying what comes to you to say, and say it and allow it to come to you until finally the vo your mind speaks to you. And it takes a, sometimes with some people are so um, repressed and are so aware of what they ought to say that they find it difficult or they're shy about their own thoughts. Your brain speaks to you all the time. It's talking to you all the time. It's going through your head all the time. Most people are blocking it out. I the think if you are allow yourself, what? I think that, that what I always tell my students or uh, when people ask is that you need to be uh, really honest and mm -hmm. to say the things that you wouldn't tell people. That's right. To write the things that you wouldn't what, that you wouldn't share otherwise. And mm -hmm. that's the and the, it's in the telling of telling the truth that makes your work so powerful and so yours right. and so giving to other people. Mm -hmm. Abigail, why is that? Why are we constantly try to repress one another, to keep one another, whether it's in literature, whether it's in finance, whether it's in... It, yeah, it is fear. Why is it's, that? I uh, mean... It's Republican. <laughs> <laughs> now, Miguel, how do you feel? I mean, you're, 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 you're with moms. I mean, you've been with her all your life. How do you feel when moms is up there at, at the podium and and people are saying these wonderful things about I'm her. thrilled. I I since I was little, since I was, you know, six years old. Well, eight, at least eight years old. I've been going to my mother's poetry readings, and you know, I used to sit in the audience and laugh the loudest and uh, recite them out loud with her, probably to her annoyance. But mm -hmm. I I've always. Uh, I love my mother's poetry. I mean, I read Shakespeare and I read my mother, and those are my She's two read biggest all of influences. And I just think that uh, when other people love her, it makes me feel hopeful about the world because what she does is, you know, she speaks to help the world. I mean, it's part of, you know, it's, it's she say as it's helping save the world with her work. So could can we be uh, optimistic as to where we are headed? You know, it doesn't seem really good but no. could one still look at there's a there's still hope there's only hope in in I think in creativity and in, in what we have to I think that it's we're at a real real hopeless situation at this point but yeah I think that you know I hope that things can turn around and and that there will be uh, you know the, the the, this country will get wonderful again, and and I think poetry is one of the things that will help save it. I mean, I, I'm sure of it. I'm sure of it. Uh, what, a couple of last questions here, uh, Ruth. You said uh, earlier at the podium uh, that women are breaking through. At least you, it seemed to be breaking. Through, but then you also said, on the other hand, that you don't really know. Um, what do you mean breaking? Breaking through in terms of, because it used to be a very male-dominated, Oh, you know, about uh, women, you mean. And it seems... I don't it, know how it happened. It seems, I think it came along because of uh, the women's movement uh, had slowly helped and uh, women becoming independent. Part, what? Of which you were a huge part yeah. of the women's movement. Uh-huh. Yeah, I, I was in part of it in the beginning, uh, or in this century, Always. this past century, but... Uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, also I suppose it might have been um, some of the magazines, uh, literary magazines have been, uh, t you know, also um, organized and, and edited by women too. There have been, there's been that, but oh, it's because women went to school more. And mm. uh, and went to, and you know their voices became stronger when I think when they were heard. I came up through the universities a lot of it. However, how about rap in New York? There, uh, it's poetry has come from a lot of places in in this past uh, uh, century. 
Don't you agree? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. I have a question that I want to direct to both, mm -hmm. and I really don't want to hold you up any longer. But the same woman who inspired me to write this poem, because I thought she, she thought and still thinks that she's beautiful. Who is it? <clears throat> this, <laughs> this girl, Vicky, that I recently met. Um, but the interesting thing is, we went out one day, and we started talking, and she had said, and I was so surprised, that when she was in high school, all the male professors, or all the male instructors, encouraged her, her, encouraged her to, why don't you become a school teacher? Why oh, yeah. Don't you? Oh, and I'm saying, I can't believe that. Oh, yeah. I mean, this is the, the, the we're living in today's time, and men are still... Yeah. Still, well, I'll tell you why. It's why, because I think a great many of these men grew up and have grown up in, a, in the idea that only men have uh, the authority to say certain things and to have a, you know, a voice, and that women are supposed to take care of them. It's the, they learn it from their mothers and fathers, you know. Uh, it's very hard to unlearn. It's very hard for them to learn to share uh, some of that. Uh, uh, you know, the authority of being a poet. Hmm. I also, well, I'll tell you one of the reasons why I think that, that women have become more important in the literary world today, and maybe this is off the wall, but I really think this is true, that a lot of the men uh, in this past century have gone off and died in the wars, and there are way more women now than there are men, and so I think that has helped too. Do you agree, Mother? I don't think, know. It's possible. I think, it's that, possible. I think it's possible. that a lot of that, that yeah. there are more women, and and there's you know strength in numbers, and and that uh, uh, women have taken over a lot of the positions that were originally men. I think the New Yorker was even taken over by a woman at one point. Um, so I mean, I, I think that that that's helped women uh, in this century, but. Maybe that's wrong. I don't know. It's, it's, it's many it's many things. But um, whatever it is, it's been a good thing to hear the woman's voice. And I think that um, men thought, w wouldn't, have, wouldn't write about the things that women began writing about, including the body. Uh, and you know, at first they made a lot of fun of it. Uh, but then they began accepting it. And then they, I think they began writing about it too. Don't you? Yes, I do. And, and uh, my, that's all to the good. And when Mother, uh, when I was, I remember clearly when Mother gave a reading at um, Yale uh, one year and, and at many other places, I remember men getting up and standing up in the middle of her reading and walking out in, enraged because she was talking about the body, you know, parts of the body, and they didn't want to hear it, you know. She has a poem called Cox and Mares that used to just enrage the men and they'd all get up and march out. Yeah. But that's changed now. They, that would never happen now. That no. would never happen. Well, that's why I was so surprised to hear her tell me that. Yeah. That it's still happening. It's still being preached. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it seemed, well, and actually I grew up, my father died when I was very young, so of course I grew up in a household with, run with, by a mother. with, with two sisters and a mom. Uh, so, you know, great. of course I became the man and started doing what I thought was the manly things to do, but always had and always will have a high respect for women. Oh, yeah. So I, I look at women totally different in the sense that when you grow up around them when you're young, you know, you understand what they go through, you understand what happens, and you hear the stories. And you would think that men nowadays, there are a lot of men now that have grown up from, uh, and, and, and certainly the generation coming up, have grown up with single moms. And um, there were a lot of families without dads in, them and, uh, in the past. 40 years and 50, maybe 50 years, and so oh, I yeah. think this generation is going to be much more respectful toward women, or hopefully, I know that my son grew up with just women around him, and and he, he you know, believes that women are, you know, that equal. we're all equal. Then he just, I mean, he doesn't believe it, it just lives it, that's what, right. yeah. And in closing, what do you guys want to say? This is going to be on, this is on camera, this is... Uh, these uh, these interviews will be excerpts or in and out of the reading at the podium. Anything that you want to say that the public will hear? I really love my mother and I really respect her work and I 
truly, uh, I mean, she has inspired me throughout my life, and she's inspired thousands and thousands of other people, and uh, I've seen it. And she is as powerful today as she was when I was little, and, and her voice is just as important. So I'm just grateful that I get the chance to um, hear her every, you know, every reading. Well, I can tell you that my daughter, who was just speaking to you, is a, is a, great, a great writer. And uh, I've known this since she was quite young. She started doing it when she was very young. Uh, and if, that, to me, is one of the most, it's a real joy to know. Uh, and my, you know, it's kind of a family tradition, too, to be an artist or a writer. And it gives me, gives me great happiness. Uh, it, I don't know, I've been lucky to combine art and living. <laughs>